From back to a spot Don't let me down and hurt my feelings I break my heart You gotta keep on loving me, girl. Love baby, hey, hey, yeah, in the daytime. Yes, I do. Baby, uh. from the north, you gotta keep on loving me, girl. Love Diversity trainer and human rights activist Jane One, Elliott spoke at Milwaukee's NAACP recent Freedom Fund dinner. We had a chance to talk to her. Here's part of that interview. For people who don't know you, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a third grade teacher in a country school near Rice, in Riceville, Iowa. And I am here at the NAACP speaking because the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was killed by a society that hated him because he was going to change the economic situation in this country, I did an exercise in discrimination with my third grade classroom to let my little third graders, all white, all Christian children, find out how it feels to be something other than white in the United States of America. I split them according to the color of their eyes and treated those who had their own color eyes for the day the way we have traditionally treated blacks, Native Americans, Asians, all those Jews, all those who are different in appearance or in religion. And we learned more that day than I wanted to know. What did that study show you? Oh, it showed me a lot of things. Number one, it showed me that racism is a learned response. Nobody's born a bigot. You have to teach bigotry, and that's what we do in this country. I found out how it feels to be on the receding end of racism because I'm blue-eyed, and the brown-eyed children were on the top in that first day. And I found out how it feels to be treated badly by people who, over whom you have power because of the wrong, uh, cu having the wrong color eyes. I found out how it feels to be subjected to unbelievable and unreal discrimination because of a physical characteristic over which I had no control. I thought I knew about racism. I thought I knew about child psychology. I knew nothing. I, all I knew was what I had learned in school. And what I had learned in school was not education. What I got in school wasn't education. It was indoctrination. I was taught how to be a good American citizen. And in this country, we think that the only Americans are the ones who live in the contiguous 48 states of the United States. Americans are everybody from the very north tip of Canada to the very south, southern tip of South America. But we, in our arrogance, say that we are the only Americans. If you're really going to keep this America to Americans, we don't dare build a wall on the southern border of the United States because those people, those brown-skinned people that are going to come across that border are Americans. Now we'd better choose our language or choose our behaviors. Let me tell you something, it wasn't a study and it wasn't an experiment. Exercise. I don't experiment with children without their knowledge or their permission. It was, an ex it was experiential education. It was giving a child an experience for the purpose of changing their brain. And that's exactly what it does every time I do it. Now you conducted the same study, uh, I'm sorry, not study, Exercise. Exercise with adults. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And is it any different between the children and the adults? Adults get more violent. I've been hit several times by black, white males, angry white males. I've had a knife pulled on me. They ran, ran me out of Uniontown, Pennsylvania at midnight one night, three carloads of blacks did, to get me out of town because the teachers that I put through the exercise in a very limited way were so angry that they called the superintendent in the afternoon and said, if you don't get that bitch out of town, we're going to kill her. So they got me out of town. First time I've been scared, and the last time I've been scared, because I found out that day that they could kill me, but they couldn't kill the idea. Victor Hugo said, no force on earth can stop an idea whose time has come. The idea of one race, the human race, is an idea whose time has come. We are not going to be able to stop it. No matter what they do, they can elect Trump after Trump after Trump, and that will not stop the idea that there's only one race on the face of the earth, it's the human race, and we are all members of it. You and I are cousins. Now, if you don't like being my cousin, that's too bad for you. But we are all in the same family. We are members of the family of man. You say that all whites are racist. Can you ex expound on that, please? Any, any white person who was born, raised, and schooled in the United States of America, if you aren't a racist, you're a miracle. Either that or you decided to educate yourself. 
because education in this country is about white is right, brown's all right, black's got to stand back. Yellow's mellow, but whites, we, we educate in a way that says that white males have done all the adventures, have made all the adventures, have done all the discovering, have made all, and everything that is good and has been accomplished has been accomplished according to social studies, which is actually anti-social studies, by white males. It's a lie. But we do that in order to maintain the myth of white superiority. The myth of race has to be maintained at all costs in this country. Because if white people have to give up the color of their skin as being something that makes them perfect, what do they have left? If we start teaching the truth about history, if we start teaching about Nile Valley contributions to civilization, it will totally change the way we conduct ourselves in the classroom. It will have to. Columbus didn't discover America. You can't discover a place where people are already living. But we celebrate that every October. It's a lie. We need to, get over, we, we need to stop telling the myths and start telling the truth. So when you tell people that they're racist, and it, it must have some kind of effect because most people will say, I'm not racist. I'm not a racist. Why, some of my best friends are black. Right. Yeah, and then you say, name one. <laughs> or this one, I don't see color. And when some woman says to me, I don't see color, I say, I knew that if you saw color, you wouldn't dye your hair that way. Or I say, if you, didn't, if you saw color, you wouldn't wear that shirt with those pants. I believe that you don't see color. It's an attempt to deny skin color. And it's attempt, an attempt to deny what's wrong with seeing the color of my skin. Is it all right for you to see me kind of pink? That's okay for me. I don't mind. I, and I suspect that you don't mind being seen the color you are. You have a right to be what you are. And until people in this country and people in this world get it into their heads that the first modern human beings that evolved on this earth were black women. They evolved in sub-Saharan Africa about 280,000 years ago. And every human being on the face of the earth today runs the has the memory of those black women's genetic structure in their genes. Now, we don't want to admit that, but that's the way it is. And people, as people moved farther and farther from the equator, their bodies produced less and less melanin, so their hair, their skin, and their eyes got lighter. As they moved into the east, they ate a lot of fish and a lot of vegetables, so their skin took on a different tone. I found, I found that out when I was raising little kids. My husband worked in a supermarket. He, had, he was head of the produce department. And they had lots of oranges that they couldn't sell, so he'd bring them home. And I was feeding my kids orange juice like you never saw in your life. They began to have an orange cast to their skin. I thought they had something, a liver problem. So I took her to the doctor, and she said, what are you feeding these kids? I said, well, lots of orange juice. She said, stop it if you want them to stop being orange. Now, if you think that skin color isn't anything other than the body's natural reaction to the natural environment, get over it. So if all white people are racist, according to you, can they be reprogrammed? Of course they can. Of course they can. Of How? course they can be. You, it's called education. I'm an educator. The word educator comes from the root duck deuce, which means lead, the prefix e, which means out, the suffix ate, which means the act of, and the suffix or, which means one who does. An educator is one who is engaged in the act of leading people out of ignorance. Now, I know you can change them. My, the second... The second year I did the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise in my classroom, it was filmed by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. They gave me a copy of that film. I showed it to my father. My father was about 59 years old at the time. He's been a farmer all his life. He raised six, he raised six, seven, six kids, lost one, raised, seven, raised six. Watch that film as a 59-year-old man. When it was over, he stood up, and with tears in his eyes, he took his red handkerchief out of the back pocket of his overalls, his bib overalls, and said, I wish somebody had taught me that when I was nine years old. Nobody had dare say to me, this doesn't work. This is too harsh. This isn't necessary. You can't teach an old dog new tricks because they're wrong. You can teach an old dog new tricks. You can teach people to give up the myth of racism. Somebody taught the Greeks to give up the myth that the sun was a god in a golden chariot that went across the sky every morning. They believed that for hundreds of years. We have believed the myth of three or four races, different races in this country, for long enough. 572 years or something like that is enough of that. It was a lie to begin with, and it's a lie to... The trainer and human rights quality. activist Jane Elliott. Now, we, we often hear about reverse racism now. There's no such thing as reverse racism. 
There's no such thing as reverse racism. You can only be a racist if you have the power to institutionalize what you're doing to people who are different from you. What, you're call what we're calling reverse racism is natural reaction to being treated unfairly on the basis of somebody else's ignorance. Now, don't ever let anybody say to you or about anyone around you that people don't like that person because of the color of their skin. That isn't the reason pe white people don't like people of color. They don't like people of color because they don't understand about skin color. And they don't understand that we all are descendants of somebody who looked like your mother. That's deep. Um, you, want, you don't really want to get me started on this. Because I, I do want to get you started. I'm really angry about what, how we are miseducating the American mind. And, and what, what I like the most about what you're doing in your exercises is that you come in with a very direct attitude. You even call yourself the B word. Well, but you see, the B word for me is the one that's most often used to refer to me. It used to bother me a lot. For me, the B word is an acronym for being in total control, honey. So and, and you want to call me that? Uh, it'll prove to me that you're out of control. And then I'll whip out my little Lorena Bobbitt fruit knife and take care of it for you. Go on. So is it necessary to strip away all of a white person's power? like in your exercises in order for them to see the light? Or is there another way it's to... Necess it's necessary to do what we do in offices and in the military and in schools and colleges and in hospitals and in community groups all the time. What we do is we become our parent ego. We go into our parent ego state and that forces all those we're working with into their child ego state. And if you watch our present so-called president, he spends most of his time either in his child or his parent ego state. He never gets into his adult ego state unless he's reading off the teleprompter. And he is such a poor reader that oftentimes he makes mistakes and then he is instantly in his child ego state right in front of your very eyes. It's absolutely fascinating to watch it happen. Speaking of our president, a lot of people say that racism has risen under, under him. Do you I mean, anybody who doesn't say that hasn't been paying attention. It absolutely has. I'm getting more hate mail now than I have gotten for years. The kinds of things that are being said in this country today are things that he has said for the last two years. He has said them publicly and he got elected because he said them publicly. We have a group of people in the United States of America who were in response to eight years of a black man in the White House and the possibility that they might have from four to eight years of a woman in the White House will elect anything that walks and can chew gum at the same time. This, this, this last election, as far as I'm concerned, was a direct response to having a black man in the White House for eight years. And it's time to change the White House to the President's House. This is ridiculous to call the place where the President of the United States lives the White House. It, gives the, it sends the wrong message. It says, I remember when Richard Nixon said to a group of reporters, I'm trying to save the White House for you white people. That says it all. And at that moment I thought, well, wait a minute. Now this is something that has to be changed, and it has to be changed. Nothing can stop an idea whose time has come. It's time to change the name of the White House to the President's House or the President's Residence, which has a nice ring to it, don't you think? <laughs> okay, let's just say that Donald Trump, President Trump, is trying to bring the country together like he said he would do. He was, wait a second, he's trying to bring the country together. How would he go about doing that? And, and Resign. If he really wants to bring the country together, all he has to do is resign and take his what do you call him with him? The second in command, the vice president. That would bring the country together. But right now, the only way he can bring the country together is put somebody else in the president's office. He does not know how to be a president. He does not know what legislation is about. He does not know how to do this job. He didn't intend to get this job. And had it not been for the Electoral College, he wouldn't have this job. Mrs. Clinton won the popular vote. The only reason we have this person as the President of the United States right now is because the members of the Electoral College didn't do what that Electoral College was designed to do. Thomas Jefferson designed that to make sure that no one who was unfit for that office would ever be elected President of the United States. 
the Electoral College last year absolutely defeated that. With the state of the country being what it is right now, um, there's a lot of conversations taking place about, you know, let's have a conversation about race. How would a person go about having that conversation? What can they expect to happen in, in a conversation? Well, like the that? first thing they have to do is not talk about tolerance. I found out the day I was on the bottom in the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise with my students, I found out how it feels to be tolerated. I found out that tolerance means put up with or allow me to be. I don't need your allowance and I don't need to be tolerated. I want to be valued, recognized, and appreciated. Put your tolerance where the sun doesn't shine. I do not believe in tolerance because in this country, we tolerate zits when we're little, zits when we're teenagers, hot flashes when we're old, and the flu and bad weather in between. We tolerate ugly things that are going to go away. I don't intend to tolerate anyone. I intend to recognize, appreciate, and value people, not to tolerate them. And I have all kinds of respect for the man who is part of the tolerance group in Atlanta, maybe. I have all kinds of respect for those folks, but we've got to change it from tolerance because the powerful can tolerate. The powerless have to wait to be tolerated. I have no time for that. I like that. No, I'm going to get lots of angry responses to that one. And I understand that, but I'm reading a book right now. Everybody needs to read this book. It's called, everybody has to read this. Everybody that's watching this has to read this book on tyranny. 20, 20 things that we've learned over the last hundred years in this country that have put us in the position we're in now and what we can do about it. Everybody has to read this book. They should read this book first and then they should read The Myth of Race by Robert Wald Sussman. And once you've read The Myth of Race, you will never ever again go along with the idea that there are three or four or five different races. It was a lie made up by the people who ran the Spanish Inquisition and before that, there were different colors, but there, there was, race had nothing to do. There, were, there, were, there was only one race, the human race. We made that whole thing up. It's time to get rid of it. We have the power to do that. This country got ready for World War II in about six months. And you're telling me that we can't destroy racism? White people created racism. Anything you create, you can destroy. God created human beings, the human race, and they started out black women. White people created racism. Human beings created racism. It's time to get over it. Uh, can we go back one second? <laughs> you, sure you can. You, you, you criticized President Trump. Did I? One thing that a lot of people have criticized President, former President Obama on was not speaking out on race enough. Do you think he failed in that? What if he had spoken out enough on race? Imagine what would have happened to him. The man is still alive. Do you remember Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? Do you remember Malcolm X? Do you remember all those people have been killed not because of the color of their skin, but because of the fear of white people that someone who isn't white is going to look better, sound better, act better, do better than they do? Mr. Obama was the president of all of us. He wasn't just the president of black people. He was the president of all of us. The man who's there now is and claims to be the president of the people who look like him. When he says, make America great again, what he's really saying is, make America hate again. Human rights activist Jane Elliott. Today, most urban sectors, especially Milwaukee, is, remains hypersegregated. Why is it taking so long, or why doesn't it seem like we can move the button on diversity in neighborhoods? Because the people who have the power in this country are the people who have the money. And the people who have the money are going to decide where people live. You need to realize that there are more children attending segregated schools in the United States today than there were previous to Brown versus Board of Education. And that's a fact. You need to realize that it is not the intent of white people to let this situation change in favor of anyone but themselves. And right now, white people are really frightened. If you don't understand the destruction of Planned Parenthood uh, offices, and you don't understand the wall that we're going to build on the southern border of the United States, you haven't read the book, The Birth Dearth by Ben Wattenberg. 
Ben Wattenberg was a brilliant Jewish man who was a member of the American Enterprise Institute. And he wrote a book, the first paragraph of which says, the main problem confronting the United States today is there aren't enough white babies being born in this country. He was an advisor to presidents of the United States. He wrote the book in 1987. He says, there are, if we don't change this and change it rapidly, white people will lose their numerical majority in this country and this will no longer be a white man's land. Now, I'm not misrepresenting, misrepresenting this. I'm telling you exactly, almost exactly what he says. He says, there are three things we can do to solve this. Number one, we could pay women to have babies as they have been doing in Western European nations for years. Then he says, and these are his words, not mine. Unfortunately, we would have to pay women of all colors to have babies, so we don't want to do that. He says the second thing we could do is increase the number of legal immigrants that are allowed into this country every year. Then once again he says, unfortunately the vast majority of those wanting to come to this country today are people of color, so we don't want to do that. The third thing he says, and white men, women had better pay attention to this, 60% of the fetuses that are aborted every year are white. If we could keep that 60% alive, that would solve our birth dearth. Does that sound like racism to you? And if it doesn't, I want to know why it doesn't. If it doesn't, you don't understand what racism is. And I think it does. When we close Planned Parenthood clinics, because we think they're there only for abortion, we need to take another look. They are used for many, many, many things, and many women need the things that they can get from Planned Parenthood clinics. But we are willing to do away with all that good to avoid allowing white women to have control of their own bodies. Now, nobody had better tell one of my daughters or granddaughters what they can do with their body. You haven't that right. Now, it would be interesting if we were as concerned about sperm cells, wouldn't it? Um, I mean, we could take a whole lot of fun out of you boys' lives. Right. Uh, a, a lot of people uh, don't understand a trauma associated with race and racism. Can you talk a little bit about the trauma associated with? The trauma associated with it? Yeah. One of the main traumas is it tells white people that they are superior because of the lack of melanin in their skin. And then they find out suddenly that we've got a black president. That's traumatic. That's where the trauma is. Living a lie, finding out the truth is traumatic. Finding out now recently that within 30 years, White people will be in the numerical minority in this country is going to be traumatic. And that's the reason we have to solve this problem and we have to solve it now. I will ask folks tonight, how many of you black folks want to get even with all white people? And that's what white people are quite certain blacks are going to want to do is get even with all white people. And nobody will raise their hand and then I'll say, how many of you want to get even with one or two? Every hand will go up and you know why and so do I. White people are scared to death right now, particularly white males. They're scared to death that they are going to lose their power in the future, and they are. But if you want to get ready for the future, if you want to be treated well in the future, treat others well in the present. What we do in the present constructs the future. What we have done in the past, we can learn from that. And we'd better learn from that. Those who forget the mistakes of the past are doomed to repeat them. And when you read this book, you'll realize that that's exactly what we're doing. We're repeating the mistakes that we have made in the past because we aren't teaching about these mistakes in the present. We are not teaching history that is true. We aren't teaching social studies that is true. We aren't even teaching true geography, for God's sake. Have you seen the Mercator map recently? Have you seen that great big Greenland hanging down in the middle of that map like a ripe plum? And have you seen the legend at the bottom that says South America is actually nine times larger than Greenland? Were you aware of that? Most of those watching this program are not aware of that. You, you mentioned the wall several times in the... At first we heard several things about the wall first. We, Mexico was going to pay for the wall and... No. Yeah, but you need to know that 70% of what Mr. Mr. Number 44 and a half said during that campaign wasn't true. And the wall business wasn't true either. If his mouth is moving, his lips are moving, he's probably lying. You know that as well as I do. He doesn't intend to build a wall. We can't afford to build that wall. We have no business building that wall. We would be keeping Americans out of America. What's your question? The question on the wall is there's... You know, when you talk to people about the wall, uh, certain people about the wall, there's certain people for it, certain people against it. The people who are for it, what, what's their mindset? They're scared. They're afraid those people, those 
immigrants are going to come over here and take their jobs. Let me tell you something. You can build a wall, you can build a wall 50 feet tall and smart Hispanics, Latinos, smart Ecuadorians, smart others are going to tunnel under that wall and come up in their friend's house on the other side. You can build walls until hell freezes over. You will not keep that immigration from happening. And you better hope we don't keep that immigration from happening. We need those people. Do you know what will happen to the economy of this country if we take all the people who are brown-skinned immigrants out of this country, if we send them back? Do you know what will happen to our economy? Do you know what will happen to farming in California? Do you know what will happen to the price of your fruit? Do you know how hard it will be to get a good avocado? Do you have any idea what will happen to this country's economy if all those brown-skinned people go back to Mexico? I don't think we do. I don't think people have thought about that because they are being taught not to think. They are using a language. Right now, we are using a language that includes words like extremism and ugly language about people who are different from ourselves. People are listening to those words. They aren't listening to the philosophy behind them. They aren't listening to the core principles which this person has none of. Now, um, couple, just a couple more questions. Um, when we hear, uh, when, I, when I hear people say that they're not racist and <laughs> and, and things like that, and we talk about building racial harmony in this country. I don't think I'll see it in my lifetime. Can you predict in the near future or far future when we will ever have uh, racial harmony? Oh in yeah, this in 30 years, white people will have will have found out that they have no 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 choice but to get along with those who are different from themselves. I'm not willing. I'd love to wait, but I can't. At my age, I'm not going to be here in 30 years. But we could change this situation if we chose to. During the, during the Second World War. We called the Japanese, and you'll pardon me, but this is what we called them, slant-eyed little yellow mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We didn't say that about the Germans. After the war, we rebuilt Germany and Japan, and we get along beautifully with the Japanese. That was in 1945 that we finally won that war. How, ma how many years ago was that? Figure that out quickly. I'm not a math person, but... You're not a math time. person, but you know it wasn't that far. Right. And it didn't take 50 years for us to, to have peace with the Japanese and the Germans. Even though, even though we dropped two atomic bombs on Japan, the Japanese hadn't killed 10 million people. Nowhere near that. We didn't drop any bombs on Germany, we, any, any atomic bombs on Germany. They were a different kind of people. We couldn't afford to do that. We killed how many... Japanese people with two atomic bombs and they forgave us. You want to talk about forgiveness? You want to talk about changing this thing? I cannot understand how Japanese people can stand the sight of any of us and yet they do. I cannot understand why black people who have been subjected to the ugliness that they've been subjected to in this country can get up every morning and go to work among us and not be absolutely furious. And I don't understand why we allow white people to behave the way they do. I don't understand that. And my third graders, after they'd gone through the exercise, couldn't understand it and wouldn't tolerate it. And when they went up to junior high, and a junior high teacher used the N-word, one of my, my former students said, if you're going to use that word, I'm going to go out in the hall until you stop using it, because we don't use that word in this school. That was a, sixth, a seventh grader who told his teacher off, when we have enough students who are willing to confront people who are making racist, sexist, ageist, homophobic statements, we're going to be better off. We have got to stop tolerating the intolerable. If it's intolerable for my black cousins, and every black person on this earth is one of my cousins, if it's intolerable for them, it's intolerable for me. I will not tolerate it. I will not tolerate it. That is not that. I am required not to tolerate that kind of treatment for the people who are related to me. And that's every person on the face of the earth. If your ignorance is such that you'll mistreat somebody because of your ignorance about the color of their skin, don't do it around me. Number one, I've been threatened with death lots of times. Now I say, go for it, fool. My husband died four years ago. Being with him would not be a bad thing for me. Death is not the worst thing that can happen to you. Living a worthless, useless life is much worse than dying.